Hello folks, welcome back to my solar electric home heating video series. All related solar electric heating content and projects are linked in the description down below. Previously I showed how I use direct PV DC solar power to run various converted DC space heaters in my home for several winter seasons now. Most recently I standardized on modified AC space heaters converted to DC low voltage operation, which have MC4 connectors and plug directly into the solar panel arrays. I have built over 8 of them by now. These converted DC space heaters reduce my heating bill in the winter. They do not require electronics, batteries, or inverters, and are able to operate over two skinny little wires, an efficiency all of its own compared to solar thermal, for example. This video is part three in the series. I will address some of the safety challenges related to switching DC loads in my converted heaters. So let's get started. One of the difficulties with converting an AC powered space heater to DC solar power operation is that the switches inside are simply not rated for DC or direct current and are not durable enough to switch solar panel feeds into the heater. This includes the power, high temperature thermal cutout and tip over protection switches. DC and AC do not behave the same and can cause the AC switches found inside normal AC space heaters to well closed or burn up. Relying on these switches to protect you by switching DC currents during a tip over or overheating event is truly unwise and should never be considered. Put in simpler terms, AC or alternating current can arc, but it alternates in polarity of 60 times per second or 60 hertz. DC does not alternate, it wants to keep going and is more likely to jump the gap and creates powerful arcs. By the way, many solar MC4 connectors have a notice on them that says do not disconnect under load. The reason for that is, you guessed it, arcing. If you unhook the MC4 connector while it's under load and the solar panels are driving a load, there could be a very powerful arc inside the connector and this will quickly destroy the connector and burn it up. If you search the internet for a 12 volt or 24 volt DC switch, you will find no limit in your choices. But try searching for a 48 volt or a 60 volt toggle switch and the choices look a lot different. That's because you need a tougher switch to handle higher DC voltage. And don't fall for those handful of product listings that claim their little toggle switch can handle 60 volts DC. I wouldn't fall for that one. But thankfully, the solution is simple. Just use a standard solar photovoltaic rated circuit breaker to turn the DC space heater on and off. I've been doing that for years and no problem at all. These circuit breakers have special devices inside which extinguish and redirect the DC arc, allowing them to safely switch the DC current for hundreds or even thousands of cycles. Plus they provide overcurrent protection. Check out my DC solar circuit breakers in 5 minutes video linked in the description if you want to learn more about the topic. Next problem is the tip over safety switch. It is designed to activate and turn off the heater if it tips over, otherwise a home fire would be the result. These little switches can weld shut and fail when switching a solar panel array causing a home fire. So there are various methods of addressing this. I know most DIY solar power enthusiasts are not too keen on electronics. So for months I thought about how to address this problem in a simple electromechanical way. And it turns out the solution was just too easy. Let's go to the drawing board to explain it. So I'll make this as simple as I can. You start with a solar panel array. I'm just going to draw a single wire and let's go ahead and just don't worry about positive and negative. That doesn't really matter here. The solution is we need to achieve a guaranteed circuit interrupt. This is for safety. So this is for the tilt switch. We want to make sure if this heater tilts over that we don't have a DC arc which welds the, sh the switch shut and causes a fire because the heater would simply keep running and it would be laying on the carpet or whatever and it would cause a fire. How do we interrupt the circuit? Now, by default, you have a switch, which I'm going to draw like this. So we're going to start with a single switch. And over here, we have our heating coil. Now, this is the tip over protection. So I'll just write that in here. It's not an on off switch. This is just a tip over protection circuit. I'm not talking about the on off switch or anything else. We've already addressed that. So the problem is the cheap little switches that they put inside these heaters are not able to really interrupt 50, 60 volts DC, 40 volts DC. They really aren't suitable for handling solar panels because there will be a really ferocious arc inside that switch and eventually that's going to cause a problem. So how do we solve this problem? Simply put, if my heater tips over and I happen to be running it on DC, say 50 volts DC, that little switch there can burn my house down because this heating coil here will stay on, this switch could weld shut and fail and I could burn my house down with solar panels. Okay, so that's simply an unacceptable risk. And it's, some subscribers have been asking me about this problem, and I've actually been thinking about it for months. Unfortunately, due to medical issues and a thousand other things, I haven't been able to put a lot of videos out. 
but I came up with a simple electromechanical solution to this problem. I think that most DIY solar power enthusiasts don't care too much about electronics, and there is an electronic solution to this entire problem, but you would have to know how to make uh, electronic circuits with microcontrollers and MOSFETs and so forth, and I want to avoid that. So what I'm presenting here is a temporary but quite effective solution to tip over safety, and it might even be a permanent one. The decision will be up to you. I'm going to be using the circuit myself, and I will be very careful with my heaters, and it does allow a lot of safety and protection from tip over events. Let me show you how it works. So the solution suddenly occurred to me, and here's part of it. This may look a bit odd, but what this is, is it's called a tip over switch. And some heaters have these, some heaters don't. If you're interested in supporting the channel, I have this linked in the description. But if you don't want to use the link, search your favorite website for tilt switch. Again, tilt switch. So this type of switch in the vertical orientation conducts electricity, but as soon as you tilt it, it turns off. Now this particular switch is rated at 16 amps, 125 or 250 volts AC. However, it's also got a DC rating. Now this is very, very rare, folks. It's hard to find a switch like this. It has a 42 volts, 16 amps rating. This is indeed a rare switch and if you ask me, it's very valuable for the type of heaters that I'm making. And there is a closer shot of the tilt switch, and you can see that it has a 16 amp 42 volt DC rating on there. Now I would take that with somewhat of a grain of salt, but some of my heaters run right around 45 volts DC, and I think that this switch is able to handle that much voltage. And you can see right there, it's also an AC switch, but we're only using DC. So, yeah. However, the story doesn't end there. That's actually not the whole solution. So the problem is, as I mentioned earlier, is we need a guaranteed circuit interrupt. If that heater falls over, we don't want DC arcing a switch close. So let's assume this switch here is the switch that came with the heater. It's probably a tiny, cheap little switch. It has no DC rating. It can't handle DC. So what if we modify the circuit, and instead of just having this switch here, this is the built-in switch, what if we take a second switch and put it in series? like that. And so now what you have is you have guaranteed circuit interrupt because there's no way that both of those switches are going to fail. And also when you open up two places in a DC circuit, it's much more likely to interrupt the arc. You're putting a lot more distance between the two and there's nowhere for that arc to go. It's going to help extinguish any arcing. And even if this switch sticks shut right here, it doesn't matter because this switch here will open. And since this switch has a DC rating, I'm far more likely to believe that it will be able to handle interrupting a circuit like that than the cheap little AC switches that you find in almost every space heater. Because my original plan was to take another switch and put it in series. So really I would have two of these. And as you see here, it has these mounting locations. And there's no reason why I can't stack two of them up, use a really long screw or a bolt or just anything, and then wire them in series and mount them somewhere inside or outside the heater. And then I can either disconnect the original tip over switch or just use these two switches in conjunction with the third one. It's not necessary, but think about it. If you have three tip over switches, there's no possible way that three switches are going to weld or have a failure event and prevent that heater from switching off. So what this is, is a guaranteed circuit interrupt. So here we have our heating coil. We have DC coming in and if it tips over, three switches potentially would activate, even if one of them completely fails and arcs shut. It doesn't matter because this switch here is exceedingly unlikely when you're running around 50 volts DC to fail. I really don't think it will. It does have a DC rating. It is a relatively nicely made switch. However, I know these can fail, and so you would definitely want to test a switch like this. So what we have here is an electromechanical solution, which is going to give me guaranteed circuit interrupt if this heater tips over. And I don't want to risk the heater falling over. And just because I was silly enough to put solar panels into a heater, burn my house down. That would be really stupid. And I don't want something like that to happen. And if you guys want to build heaters like this, I would definitely consider above all else the tilt uh, switch as part of your design if you don't want to use electronics because it's really the only thing we can use. We have to have some kind of a tilt switch and the little tiny uh, lever switch that's found in the bottom of many heaters, that just can't handle it. 
But if you put more than one switch in series, you're, you're guaranteeing a circuit interrupt. You're guaranteeing that if a switch fails, it's still going to turn off the heater. And best of all, there's no electronics. It's purely electromechanical, and it's easy to understand. I mean, who doesn't understand if you put two switches in series, if one of them fails to open, the other one will still open the circuit, and you'll be saved. And, of course, you could always just completely remove the original switch and use two of these tilt switches. Now, regarding the last problem, which is the high temperature thermal safety cutout, it's also a switch, and most of the space heaters nowadays will have some kind of a thermostat in the circuit somewhere. Uh, it's not really used as a thermostat, and you really never want it to activate. What happens is if the heater gets too hot, you'll hear a, a click or a ping, and something will open. Now, those thermostats can be found in the heater. If you look inside where the heater coil is, you'll see it probably. The problem with those is they're not DC rated either, I don't believe. And so I don't want to depend on that. If my heater, let's say someone throws a blanket over my heater, these tilt switches aren't going to save me. The only thing that's going to save it is the thermostat or high temperature thermal cutout. What I'd recommend is don't take the existing thermal protection device out, but place something else in series with it. And what we could place in series with it is we could double them. We could place two thermal switches in series like this. We could also take a thermal fuse and we could take a thermal fuse and we could use a one-time thermal use fuse that would basically, once the temperature gets too high, it will permanently blow. So that would be something that I would recommend in a heater design if you're going to run it off a of DC. We need something that is going to open the DC circuit, even if it's 50, 55 volts DC, if you're going to go up that high. And a thermal fuse would allow you to do that. Having two of these thermostats in series, again, guarantees an interrupt. Keep in mind that all these things I'm telling you are at your own risk. They're improvised engineering solutions until we have something better. Nobody is selling PV space heaters right now. It simply did not exist. It should have existed 10 years ago, and we just have to work with what we have. So this kind of a circuit uh, is, going to, is going to interrupt when there's too much heat. You would have to make sure and get the value of this thermal fuse correct. And you can also look at the thermal cutoff device inside the heater and try to see what specification that's at. You know, is it 300 degrees or whatever? and try to match your thermal fuse to possibly be a little bit lower than that if you can so that it's a little more likely to blow because what i do with my heaters is i underrate them anyway and i use less heat that's for safety so my heaters don't put out quite as much heat as the stock heater would have and i do that on purpose it's called underrating you underrate the heater and it gives me a little bit of extra safety margin in addition to all these other devices now this is a purely electromechanical solution there's no electronics However, I will touch briefly on electronics because I get a lot of questions. So here's one last thing. If there's one thing I get questions about and comments about all the time, it's solid state relays. Should I use a solid state relay um, to turn my heater on and off? Now, a solid state relay could be looked at as a cheap and easy way to turn your heater on and off or turn anything on and off. However, I do want to give you a warning about solid state relays. No, I don't recommend them. No, I don't trust them. And no, I don't use them. Why is that? You would think that a solid state relay would be such a simple and easy solution to the problem because it's not going to arc. It's a solid state semiconductor. However, there's a problem. Inside a solid state relay, there's really nothing inside. By the way, these solid state relays that you can buy are known for failing. It happens all the time. They're cheaply made and they're not reliable. End of story. Now, I'm not saying there aren't good ones out there, but they're known for failing and they're really not worth the effort if you ask me. And I'm not going to risk burning my house down because of a cheap solid state relay from some online e-commerce store. But I will explain what's wrong here. So let's just draw a solid state relay simple like it appears. It's literally just, it's got some wires going in and you have basically your DC coming in and your DC going out. And I'm going to make this really simple. I'm actually just going to draw it like this. It's not really how it is, but that's not actually how the circuit looks, but I'm just going to draw it like that. So what's supposed to happen is you put your DC in here, and you're supposed to be able to feed another current in here and turn that on and off electronically using solid-state controls. Inside a solid-state relay, there's actually power transistors. There's one or more power transistors. So a power transistor, they fail too. And usually that's what happens with these things. They fail. Unfortunately, the way they fail is they often fail... 
short. In other words, they are a short circuit. What does that mean? What it means is that when this thing fails, it's going to stay on. It's stuck on. So this is just like a mechanical relay. It's, it can get stuck on. And once this thing is stuck on, you're not going to be able to turn it off. There's nothing you can do to turn that off. It's going to be stuck on. You would literally have to cut the wires or disconnect it from the source. And so for that reason, I don't recommend solid state relays for any of these kinds of projects. It's not worth burning your house down because of a $13 solid state relay from an online store. So I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just giving you a helpful warning that if you're going to delve into engineering space heaters that run directly off solar panels, safety is number one. Nothing else matters more because you don't want to burn your house down with a science experiment. So solid state relays, at least for my household, are out. I would never put one of those inside my heater or use it for anything that can get hot and burn down. I'm not burning my house down because of a $13 part. So I want a purely electromechanical solution, and I think these tilt switches are simply the most elegant thing that you could use. And they're not perfect. This is not ideal, but short of designing a sophisticated electronic circuit, something like this, when run in series with multiple switches, is going to provide the guaranteed circuit interrupt that you need. So just a quick review. To turn the heater on and off, if you're running around 48 volts DC, we can use a standard solar photovoltaic circuit breaker, which is rated for thousands of operations. It handles the arcs. It is able to extinguish arcs. For tip over protection, rather than relying on the single switch that's inside the heater, we're going to use more than one switch in series, preferably something decent like this, a tilt switch. And you may or may not leave the existing switch in that circuit. It's up to you. You could have 50 switches in series. It doesn't matter as long as they all activate pretty much the same time. And my designs have a minimum of two or three switches in series to guarantee circuit interrupt. And lastly, for the high temperature thermal cutout circuit, you're going to want to use an additional protective device in series with the last one. So originally, the heater will have some kind of a thermostat or high temperature cutout. Simply add another one in series, or if possible, use a one-time thermal fuse. And I've suffered too much for too long to risk a house fire over my experimental heaters. So to me, all of this is not overkill, it's just barely scratching the surface of what's adequate. And I hope that those of you who want to build your own heaters and run them off of solar panel rays will keep these things in mind. And hopefully you will have a good safety margin and you won't have to worry about burning your house down or anything like that. We don't want the things like that to be happening. Folks, I have to keep this video short due to an avalanche of medical and other issues. I will be posting further uploads as soon as possible. Please bear with me. I have a ton of projects to finish and upload related to solar electric heating, solar cooking, and a whole lot more. Please stay tuned and thanks for watching.